Okay, so there's one final sort of revision that we'll make to this contract to make it more Ethereum-like, uh, to, to make it actually use the, the main reason that you want to use blockchain in the first place, or, or one of the main reasons is uh, with blockchain technologies like Ethereum, you have a payment system that's on board. Uh, so in Ethereum's case, you have Ether. And so being able to transact Ether and tie the payment of Ether into your contracts that's like the big kind of selling feature uh, of, of, of what Ethereum will do for you, okay? The, I'm not saying that if you don't have any financial layer to your application at all, that, that it doesn't make sense to run it on Ethereum. Uh, there are some applications where, where it still is a good blockchain use case, even if you don't have payments. But anyways, this idea of having payments uh, sort of involved in your uh, smart contract is, is, is something that we definitely want to explore. Okay, so this is the contract uh, that we've seen so far, and this will be the new version of it, but don't just don't pay attention to this yet. Um, let's talk about conceptually what we wanna do. So this is my idea. Uh, my idea is we have this uh, function, sorry, this contract, and the function inside of the contract lets you set an integer, and uh, we add this modifier that basically said, okay, only the owner is allowed to uh, set this function or to set this, to call this function or set this integer since that's the result of this function. Now, here's a new idea. What if we do this and we're gonna open it back up so that anybody uh, can set this integer, but they have to pay, okay? So like, let's say for example, you have to pay one ether if you wanna be able to, to set this integer. Uh, so anybody that comes along that wants to set the integer, what they'll do is they'll send They'll call set, you know, whatever, set 10. Um, so here's the contract and we'll assume that it already exists on the blockchain. And uh, somebody is going to come along and they're going to say, I want to run set 10 on this. And they're going to pay gas just for the running of this function, okay? And then additionally, what we're going to say is you're going to pay something extra. So on top of the gas, uh, you're also going to put in a payment of one ether, for example. Uh, and then we're going to let you run set 10 uh, and then we'll update the integer and the integer will now be 10. Okay. Um, so let's say before it was eight. Okay. So someone wants to run set 10, uh, they pay the gas, one ether. This comes from a certain address. The address will be in message.sender. That's how the Solidity contract learns the address of the person who's uh, sending this particular transaction. Um, Okay, and so, so these are restrictions. So the question is, how do we do this? How do we add this sort of one ether as a requirement to run this particular function? Um, also, where does the money go? Okay, so, so you pay one ether uh, to, to update this contract. This contract is listing, listed at an address. Uh, so in this case, it's um, a contract account uh, as opposed to an external account external or for people like Bob, for example, this this would be, for example, an external uh, account or address. This would be a contract address. Okay. And the answer is, where does the one ether go? Well, it actually goes into the contract. Okay. So the contract now owns the one ether. Okay. And who's allowed to spend the one ether that exists in the contract? Well, the contract code itself is going to have to spend that ether. So you're going to have to write code in your contract that says if you ever have a balance, what you're allowed to do with that balance. Okay. Uh, so there's no, the contract isn't a person. So it's not like if, if it builds up a bunch of money, it's not like um, someone can come along and, and transfer that money out. The, the contract itself has to take care of how the, the, the money that's loaded into it is then dispersed, okay? And there's two common ways. There's sort of a default way, and then there's, you can custom code uh, how you want it uh, to work. And so I tried to write an example that, that will show you both of these, okay? So this is sort of the mental model. It's a little weird. All of Ethereum is a little weird, but once you get kind of comfortable with the mental model, uh, then you can uh, start to see uh, different things that you can do uh, with Ethereum, okay? So I'll just note that the, the one ether becomes the property of the contract. So you can have a smart contract like this and the contract itself can hold money and it could accumulate a lot of money. 
uh, if lots of people want to set this integer and they're all paying an ether, you could build up lots and lots of ether inside of this contract. Okay, so let's take this one by one. So I'll show you the new um, the new set uh, function, and then we'll uh, maybe we'll just take it from top to bottom, and then I'll introduce all the changes to the contract uh, as we see the modifications here. Okay, so we have our function. It's called set. Uh, parameters are exactly the same. I also cleaned this code up a bit because in the next lecture, we're actually going to push it to Ethereum. So uh, the Ethereum compiler was complaining about some small things like not declaring things explicitly as public and things like that. So there's also a few other mi minor modifications that don't really mean much. Um, but anyway, so we have this uh, parameter. And now we have uh, two modifiers here that are different uh, than this. So here we have only owner, uh, which we defined last time that was the modifier. We don't want only owner anymore because we're saying anybody can run set, they just have to pay. And so there's two functions here. One's called paid and one's called payable. Paid is a custom modifier, so it's something I wrote. Uh, unfortunately, I should have maybe picked a, a much different name. Payable is an Ethereum modifier, okay, uh, or Solidity more specifically. Um, and so this is a is a keyword in Solidity, and we actually saw payable before. So all along we had our fallback function, uh, which had this payable modifier, but we said we'll we'll wait until longer, or sorry, to later to to actually say what it means. Okay, what does payable mean? Payable means that if you run this function, you're allowed to send money along with it. Okay, in other words, let's say you have get, which we've always had. Uh, get is not payable. So what would happen is if you try and say get and you know you have to pay your gas, but if you try and staple some ether uh, to it as well, uh, then the function, it won't run. The, the Ethereum uh, network will reject it. The other thing I didn't explicitly say that now that I'm looking at this picture, I should have said, where does this one ether come from, right? Well, the one ether comes from this address, okay? So the address that runs set 10 also has to have that one ether in this address. And so it moves from this address ultimately to the contract's address, okay? So that's the flow. So if this address has 100 ether and it sends one ether along with this set, then it's gonna only have 99 after this operation is completed. Uh, and then this contract address, say it had zero before, it now has one. Uh, so that's the update uh, to its balance. Okay, and so not every function will accept you adding uh, ether to it. Uh, it has to have this payable uh, as a particular function, then it will, okay? Uh, so what we do is, the first thing we do is we make our set payable, meaning that now you can send money along with it, okay? Now, the next thing we wanna do is we wanna write a modifier that basically says uh, you can only run this if the amount of money that you're sending uh, is greater than one ether, okay? And so I wrote this modifier to, to accomplish this task. I called it paid, it's right here. Uh, so we can, we can backtrack up and we can see that uh, this is the modifier that's gonna run. Okay, uh, so paid will run this modifier, okay? Um, okay, so the modifier looks almost the same as the one before. Uh, there's a require condition uh, and if it returns true, then we run the actual, or we keep going, uh, but ultimately we run the function itself. Uh, if it returns false, it's going to throw an exception and it's going to revert the state. And we have to talk about what it means to, let's say you send one ether, but there's some sort of exception. Does the ether go to the contract or does it go back? And so the point of reverting state is that if you try and run set 10 and you hit an exception, then the one ether will go back to this address. So this address will keep it. So uh, the gas will disappear, the gas will be consumed, but the one ether that you stapled onto the run of this function, it will re be returned uh, to the person who called it, okay? Uh, so that's what happens there. Okay, so our require statement is just two logical statements with an or. And so what I thought was the person who creates this contract, the owner, they should be allowed to update for free. So if they want to do it, then that's fine. We're not going to charge them. But if they're anybody other than the owner, then we're going to charge them. Okay. So either it's true that the person 
running this function is the owner, that's case one, or case two is that the person running this function has stapled some amount of currency uh, to this in order to run it, okay? And this amount of currency is uh, in what's called Dai, uh, which is named after Wei Dai, who was a cryptographer that came up with a, a system that wasn't exactly a blockchain system, but it had some uh, kind of connections to it. And Dai are kind of like Satoshis in Bitcoin. So Satoshi was the smallest amount of Bitcoin. So Bitcoin was divisible uh, to ten or sorry to eight decimal places, and so a Satoshi is is that uh, smallest unit. Uh, in Ethereum, uh, they uh, they split it to even more, and so uh, one die is um, is like 18 decimal places of an ether. It's it's hard for me to um, uh, to phrase it. Actually, pardon me. Uh, so I'm actually completely wrong. Uh, so this sorry, this is called uh, Wei. Uh, sorry, that's his first name. It was Wei Dai. Uh, so so it's it's called Wei, and uh, in Ethereum, uh, one Ether is 10 to the 18 way. Okay. Um, okay. So so anyway, so this ends up if you if you count all the zeros, this actually ends up being one Ether. Uh, so this is equal to one Ether. Okay. And an Ether is worth you know maybe a couple hundred dollars. Uh, you know, it depends on when you're watching this video and what happens to the exchange rate. But when I'm recording it now, it's, you know, sort of a hundred of dollars. Would anyone pay a hundred dollars to update an integer? Obviously not. Uh, but anyways, this is just proof of concept code. Okay, um, so you have this. Now, the how do you access? So this person sent uh, this function, set 10, and we said that the, the function itself ends up in message. So message is like the, the variable uh, that holds the function call. And so message.sender is the address that sent it. Message.value uh, is going to be the amount of money that was attached uh, to it. Okay. So one ether is sitting in message.value, and the address that sent it is sitting in message.sender. Okay. So if message.value is greater than uh, one ether, uh, then that's fine. Then we allow this require statement to be true. Uh, and therefore it won't throw an exception and it will actually execute uh, the code for us, okay? Uh, so the code works as it worked before. Uh, if the requirement is true, then we'll take uh, the, the parameter that was passed in, 10, and we'll update stored data. Uh, so it will go from whatever it was, say, 8 before, and now it's 10, okay? So that's what that line of code does, okay? Now what we're going to do is we're going to add two new lines of code. And these two lines of code will take the amount of money and instead of having the contract hold the ether that was sent along, what we're going to do is we're going to have the contract immediately send it to the owner. Okay, so the owner has a certain address. And uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to take that one ether and we're going to move it uh, from, uh, from the person who uh, or from the contract address uh, to the actual owner address. Okay, so the one ether will end up here. And remember, this is all atomic, so um, you know this code will actually execute. Okay, so the way that we do it is as follows: uh, we calculate how much it is. So notice that this says greater than or equal. So they might send more than an ether. Maybe they send five ether, right? So they overpay. I don't know why they overpay, but they they want to overpay. That's fine. Um, so we take whatever it is that they sent, we store it in a value uh, variable, and then we're going to transfer uh, that value uh, to the owner. And the notation that we use to transfer money to someone is address. So owner, remember, is a variable. Owner is a local, or sorry, not a local variable. It's a variable in our uh, contract uh, of type address. So if you want to transfer money, you do address dot transfer and then the amount that you want to transfer. And I actually have a lot to say about this little function because this isn't the only syntax that you can use to transfer funds. It turns out that there's a couple different ones and they have different properties and it's, it's important to actually look at these. So in a later lecture, we'll look at different uh, options you have for writing this line of code 
But anyways, this line of code will do something and we'll, we'll talk about those differences later. Okay, so owner.transfer value uh, will transfer this. And for good measure, I just made value a, a, an instance variable in the contract. It could probably be a local variable because you don't need to store the last value. As, as soon as you, you get message.value, you send it right away. You don't need to keep that variable around. Uh, if there's no other purpose for it. Uh, you could also just simply put message.value in here and then not have this extra variable. But anyways, there's lots of different ways of, of coding up uh, things that are functionally equivalent. So this is how I chose to do it. Uh, it's not necessary, but it's sufficient. Okay, um, so this is how the new set works. Okay, so the new set accepts payments. It has a modifier to make sure the payment's a certain amount. Uh, then it takes the amount and transfers it to the owner of the contract. The owner of the contract is the person who originally pushed this. So you could be the owner of this contract. You could literally right now today, if you wanted, copy and paste this into Ethereum, and then there would be this contract out there uh, where people would have to pay you one Ether to update this integer. Would anyone actually run it? Probably not, but you never know. Uh, maybe someone would, would come along and change your integer and then you would get paid uh, this one Ether. Okay. All right. So this is the first way that you get paid. So one way is I said um, when a contract holds Ether, so it temporarily is holding it, uh, but then it's transferring it out right away. Okay. So that's one way you can have logic in the contract that tells you how to get rid of it. And you don't have to get rid of it right away. You could store it and then later on you could decide to disperse it. Uh, so, so you don't have to you don't have to do something with that value right away. If if we remove these two lines of code, uh, that would still be a valid contract. Uh, all that would happen is if we remove these two lines of code, is the contract would just keep building up money, building up money, building up money. Okay, so it wouldn't instead of the owner getting the payment, uh, the contract would just hold. You know, if ten people ran this, then it would hold all ten of their payments uh, as the balance of the contract. So another thing that we think of is, well, especially if you make a mistake or something like that, there should be a way that maybe the owner of the contract can just come along to the contract and say, hey, give me everything that's in the contract, okay? Um, give me the complete balance of the contract. And there's two ways. You could code up a special function that says that. Um, but there's another function that's useful, uh, which is called self-destruct. And what self-destruct does is it takes a single uh, parameter which is called owner uh, and basically it deletes the contract it deletes all the state it can't delete the history of the contract so the history of the contract will still be in the blockchain but it basically updates the blockchain to say hey this this contract is now defunct uh, you can't call it anymore and whatever balance is left in the contract address gets sent to whoever the per the address is that's specified here okay so in this case, we wrote it in such a way that when self-destruct is called, uh, the owner is going to get the payment of whatever money's in this contract, okay? And we want to make sure that only the owner is allowed to call this function. Otherwise, anyone could come along at any time and, and call it and it would kill the contract. They wouldn't, they wouldn't make money from it because the money would get sent to the owner, but still you wouldn't want someone, you know, to, at an arbitrary time to just come along and kill your contract, okay? So what we do is we keep this only owner modifier that we made in the last lecture, and now we're gonna use it on this sort of done function, uh, which will basically kill off the contract, okay? So this is another way uh, to, to transfer funds. It's kind of like the default way. And so uh, in general, you know, you can think hard about why you wouldn't wanna have this line of code, but in general, uh, you know, most contracts that you write will probably have this, and it's it's good there, just good to have there, just as a fallback, uh, especially if if you, you know, sometimes these contracts get really complicated, and there's weird bugs or issues, and you can't change the code once you push it. We talked about that, and so sometimes you want to get your money out, and so having this as a kind of fallback uh, is is a good way uh, to get it. Okay, uh, the rest of the function is exactly the same, so we still have the get. Uh, I just added public to it. I also added a modifier called view. Uh, view is also in a, a solidity thing. It's not a. Uh, it's not something I wrote. It's not a modifier that I wrote, and it basically says that this function doesn't update the state. It used to be called constant. Um, actually, there might be a slight difference between view and constant. I'd have to look that up. Um, 
but but anyways, this is a, a, a function that does not update the state. Therefore, we can tell the compiler that, and it's uh, it's just good for the compiler to know, and, and Solidity will uh, insist uh, that we do it. It won't fail to compile, but it will throw a warning if, if we don't put that in. Um, so anyways, that's that, that's that little modifier. Uh, and then we have our fallback function as well. Okay, so this is a summary of, of how you add payments on top of functions that are being called. And this is really the kind of bread and butter of Ethereum. This is what makes Ethereum contracts so interesting is that you can actually kind of collect money and disperse money. And uh, notice the owner doesn't do it, like this is coded up in such a way that the owner is allowed to do certain things, but you could have this where there's no reference to the owner, anyone's allowed to do anything. Uh, and it can be su completely self-governed. This contract will just run on the blockchain and it will do whatever the code says and whatever, um, whatever funds come in and how it's dispersed will be governed only by what the code says. Uh, and so there's no one that can change that code. And so this allows you to start, set up different kind of contracts and things like that. We'll talk about use cases in the last, the last part of this course, um, but yeah.